Well, my computer says it's uh, 5.01, so I'm gonna open the meeting. And I've lost my agenda. Anybody got theirs open? I have mine, agen mine opened on. I was just looking for related documents, but um, first item on the agenda is the preliminary site plan review discussion for the East School at 219 Christian Lane. And I believe we have Mr. Robert Ober here tonight for that. Okay, and Bob is on. Yes, hello wanna, everyone. Wanna, wanna take the, uh, the screen? Sure, I'll do my best here. Everyone can hear me. We can hear you just fine. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, good evening, everyone. I'm Bob O'Bear and the general contractor and developer for the project uh, over at the, the old Waitley School on Christian Lane, previously the uh, Frontier uh, District's offices. Um, we purchased the property from the town uh, about three and a half years ago, not even been four years ago at this point. It's been kind of a lengthy process uh, to get the property nominated for the, uh, for the um, I'm sorry, the, through the National Park Service on the historical register, which uh, basically allowed the property to be eligible for historic tax credits. Uh, which is a, a major funding source for our projects that we do uh, throughout Franklin County uh, in the area. We've done about 13 or 14 historical tax credit development projects of redeveloping existing buildings uh, that we've typically purchased from other municipalities. So it's kind of a recurring business plan that we've used uh, successfully uh, several times over the last uh, seven or eight years. So uh, our initial plans are to uh, develop the project into nine uh, one bedroom apartment units, uh, basically utilizing the existing classrooms and uh, some of the area in the lower level of the building. Uh, our plans basically uh, encompass a reuse of the building, bringing all the systems up to code. Uh, new electric service, air conditioning, sprinkler system, uh, sort of all the all the uh, required systems for a property like this. Uh, we had initially sort of uh, spearheaded the zoning change uh, that the town did several years ago to allow these existing buildings to be put into reuse. I don't know if any of you were on the board at that point, but um, May, there might be some familiar faces. We we can do a bunch of those hearings and sort one of, of us drafted it. <laughs> one of you drafted it, right? There you go. Um, so I'm looking to utilize that that section of the zoning bylaws, and uh, we uh, don't have a, we we don't have the site plan done yet. I'm hoping to have it by the end of the week so that I can submit it and get on the uh, the, the the scheduled track for a public hearing and meet with you all again. Um, I do, uh, I am familiar with the process. I'm on the planning board in Montague as well as the zoning board of appeals for, uh, I've been on the planning board almost 10 years. So I, I am familiar with the process. Um, with that said, I think uh, basically, you know, we're gonna utilize the existing building. We're not making any changes to the exterior as per the, uh, the bylaws, no additions. We're utilizing the space that's there. Uh, we don't have any intention or plans to uh, to really change much else other than maybe some exterior facelifts, uh, some you know plantings. We will document our plans for the exterior lighting and a parking plan. Um, but you know, sort of the general uh, requirements of site plan review, I've you know reviewed that and I'd like to sort of open the discussion. Uh, a lot of the requirements are more for like a new project or a ground up build where this is more of an existing structure. We're not really making many changes. Um, you know, we'll do, again, we'll try to do some beautification to sort of the, uh, the, 
the the uh, curb cuts and the uh, you know the green area around the building. We'll probably do some shrubbery and a few trees to try to try to update that a little bit, make it more desirable for the neighborhood. Um, we are sort of open to suggestions and input from the board and uh, look forward to adding some some uh, very attractive housing stock to the community. So I don't know. I don't really have much more than that tonight. I, I don't have the site plan yet. So, um, but I am definitely willing and happy to field any questions any of you may have and uh, sort of open up the discussion as you see fit. The uh, sketch that you gave us um, basically just showed the, the parking spaces and we wouldn't need a whole lot more than that other than uh, outside lighting and mm -hmm. probably location of, uh, are you gonna use existing, existing septic? Yeah, we're gonna use the existing septic and I'm working with uh, the engineer right now. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Bill Ceruta of Leverett. Uh, his son, John, both uh, have long long standing relationships with for uh, many of our projects. So we're, you know, we've run into some minor hurdles with the existing setback is no one seems to have a copy of the plan or any idea who worked on it or installed the pumps. And I've, I've sort of exhausted my resources. So I, I, I you know, throw, throw the question out there if anyone has any information or anyone with the town uh, knows. I mean, basically, we know we've got a pump system out there um, designed and built for an extremely large capacity. We've got like a 9,000 gallon septic tank. So, um, you know, it's way overkill for what we're looking to do. But, um, you know, it just it's making it difficult to nail down uh, what was actually what's in place. So we're going to end up going back out there and uh, probably doing some exploration and digging up the tanks and maybe maybe doing some scoping. But basically, the way that the you know the way that the uh, Title V is written is we have an existing system. You know, we we're sort of by right allowed to install a new system if we need to. But we're quite confident that the system there is more than adequate. And uh, until there's you know any you know we're only going to have nine bedrooms, so it's a, it's a small use compared to uh, an institutional use, which was in place previously. So we're kind of working through that right now, but uh, I know the engineer will address that sort of with the site plan as well. How did you manage to uh, be able to complete the purchase without doing the Title V? Um, well, we purchased it from the town, so I don't really know. Can we know done if you are willing to assume the risk? Yeah, I, I think that was part of the deal is that we assume the risk. Um, you know, we know that we have a pretty major system there and the engineer has done some exploration and, you know, he's willing, you know, as long as he's willing to sign off on it, that's really what it comes down to. So I don't think we're going to have any issues there. The very least, I do have budgeted in my budget about sixty thousand dollars in case I do need to make upgrades or uh, any additions to the system. But I'm again, I'm pretty confident that we're not going to have any issues. We have pumps in place which were installed not that long ago, which it's surprising we're not able to find. I mean, I've checked with the building department, I've checked with the board of health, I've checked with the uh, the uh, facilities manager at the school district, the previous facilities manager. I mean, we've kind of run down, uh, you know, somebody's got this, the plan for it somewhere, but we just, we just don't know who that is. So, but uh, we're still searching and hopefully we'll find it soon. If not, we'll run a scope down there and the engineer will sign off on the system, so. I don't see any problem scheduling it for the meeting if assuming that we have plans by the end of the week or the beginning of next week? Yeah, what I'll do is I'll, I can, uh, I'm going to follow up with the engineer tomorrow and I can shoot an email over to Don uh, and sort of give him an update as to where things are at. Um, you know, it is my intention to try to get it in as soon as possible because there are some uh, major energy code changes that have come into play. Um, so, 
it doesn't take effect for a commercial building until June 1st, but right now in Massachusetts, if uh, any new home now that gets built is completely fossil fuel free, it has to be all electric. And what they've done is they've created the situation where if you're modifying your home greater than 30%, you now have to bring your entire house up to meet the current new, like new home energy code, which is quite significant, the changes that have happened. It's uh, gonna completely change conventional building and uh, be quite heavily cost-driven for the next few years. So what happens with a existing building after July 1st is that if there's any change of use, you have to bring the building completely up to meet the new energy code of a new building, which is unfortunate because it's sort of, uh, it's sort of instituting that you know we want to you know they want to knock buildings down and build new buildings instead of instead of preserving existing structures, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose of the whole concept of the idea is to use less energy. So um, anyway, it's it's a complicated matter that's uh, on the forefront for builders and developers like myself. So we're we're really looking to try to fast track the process as much as we can. And again, I know that uh, lies on me. So we're, uh, we're doing everything we can to kind of get this thing moving. So we're fully funded on the project and, uh, and ready to get started. We have a demolition permit in place already. So we've been kind of clearing out the building and uh, pulling out some of the old junk. So um, yeah, we're anxious to get started. Okay, well, I've still got your uh form of uh, february and 150 dollars is still on a deposit so yeah. all you need to do is give us a new uh request application for site plan review and yep. um, attach the um site plan itself sounds sounds good i will uh get on that i know that we do have a uh, sort of a simultaneous track going with the uh, ZBA for yeah. the uh, special permit. And I know that we have a hearing scheduled for, I believe it's April 6th. So um, my expectation is I'll, I'll be back in touch with you before that. Okay, well, we should be able to uh, go ahead and do yours for the April, our April meeting. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your all. I appreciate your time, everyone. Yep. Oh, well, just nice hold call. on on the date because that. I'm a little. Um, there was an earlier email within the board about moving things up because of a potential early annual town meeting. Judy, what would we? What dates would we have to hit? Or the nineteenth. But well, we'd have to have everything lined up by the fifth, which is next Wednesday. Does this have to go to town meeting or is it just, I think it's just the- No, it's it's just that, and your yours could be, no, we have several things going to town meeting and it's the issue whether um, they wanna move the date of town meeting. Gotcha. And wanna know if That's we can right. make that date. Yours could be independent of that, but um, we'll let, but if, if that is the case, we wouldn't, if we decide to move the meeting up to the 19th. Oh, I, I see, I see. Then we would need to have everything available. Then the legal ad would have to be printed on the 5th. Okay. And so would we would have to have everything in hand so people could look at it. Gotcha. And so town office is online by the 5th. So okay. I, I have my doubts whether we can do that for the other stuff, but it's an issue. <laughs> Well, I'll set that as my my drop dead date, and I will try to push the engineer along and get something to you soon. So that is a, a scheduling question. I, I thanks for reminding me, Judy. I got confused. This is not this. Is, the urgency here is not about town meeting. The urgency is about um, getting this done in time for other changes that the, these. Um, these energy codes going into effect. Sure, so is it at all plausible, since we, it may be that we have a lot on our plate for uh, April 19th 
public hearing. I mean, there are various things we do. I think we do want to get in front of town meeting this cycle. Maybe that's yet to be discussed tonight. Um, but I wonder if we could advise Mr. O'Bear that it, we might, well, let me ask this question. I don't know, is it plausible for the board to do a public hearing on Wednesday, April 19th on the matters that we care about for town meeting? I honestly don't think we'll know till later in this meeting yeah. how much there is still to do. Okay, okay. Because um, I, I was going to suggest I doubt that the zoning map would be ready by the fifth. Yeah. Um, just as one thing, but I mean, if we, that's not giving Ryan much time if we make changes tonight, and then somebody's going to have to look it over. And... Okay. So, so should we? So is the we can we can I'm sure he would not be happy unhappy to. To know that we'd be dealing, Mr. O'Bear would not be unhappy to know we'd be a week earlier than we were in. He, he was anticipating. Mm -hmm. If he that can't, would be, that would be great as long as I'm ready. Yeah. So, so you're not 100% sure you'll have your stuff by the fifth either. By the fifth, that's about a week away. It's possible. Exactly. I, I haven't had an update yet. I did let him know last Friday of the urgency. So, and they had already taken the, the topography of the site and had the work started. So uh, okay. I will probably just update him and let him know that um, the main items that we need to hit um, to satisfy the board and uh, which sounds like it's lighting and parking and, you know, some basic landscaping. Um, so yeah. I think that should be relatively easy, uh, but again, it's counting on a third party to get something done. It's, you never quite know. Well, we should be able to do this in the late May meeting and still give you plenty of time for, for July. Yeah. Well, we could, we could schedule it for the 26th anyway, even if, even if we do the other one on the 19th. So, yeah. but fantastic. Well, thank you all for your time. I'm uh, gonna go make dinner for my kids and <laughs> play dad. So All right. any other questions I, I can field before I sign off? I think of. All right, well, thank you all again for your time. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, is a review of the uh, changes on the zoning map. I put that next on the agenda because it seemed easiest to list all the zoning wording changes together. But since we have all of the DMCTC people here, maybe we should move them up. Works for me. Chris, you take the lead? Uh, sure. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Um, don't dislike listening to the zoning map changes, but not, not what I'm here for. Um, so yes, we're um, back to continue the, the conversation on uh, DMCTC's uh, proposal for uh, potential new use of uh, marijuana manufacturer limited, um, specifically for non-hazardous forms of, of manufacturing. Um, I had, uh, as requested, sent around the draft text that I've been working with as it stands to, I think everyone on the board was actually on that email, um, but regardless, it, it definitely got out to some of you, um, and I will bring that up just as something to have up on the screen um, as we talk through this. Um, and, you know, I think that Last week, uh, Judy accurately summarized the sort of two questions is A, is this an appropriate use to add to the commercial zone? And then if yes, is this the, the appropriate text? Um, and I think the first question is, is one to be hashed out at, at the eventual hearing if, if you hear one, if you, if, uh, if you hold one um, on the 19th. Um, and I'm, I'm more gonna focus on that second one at this time um, and the sort of primary outstanding questions in my mind were, um, A, is the restriction written correctly? 
um, in terms of separating out the hazardous versus non-hazardous forms of marijuana manufacturing. Um, and then the second one is what, what's an appropriate level of verification, uh, inspection, what have you, that approved sites would be in compliance with the bylaw. Um, and so on that first question, uh, you know, the initial draft that I had sent around a month or so ago um, had focused in on the presence or absence of what's known as classified spaces under the electric code or, or what some people know as, as C1D1s uh, or C1D2 uh, special rooms with special electrical equipment where, where certain hazardous activities occur. Um, and then after that discussion, um, we ended up in touch with Chris Witherall, who's uh, actually on, on the call uh, this week uh, from a group called PSI, and, and they're sort of the, the national leaders in third-party commissioning and inspections of, um, of marijuana extraction equipment. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll bring him in in, in just a minute. Um, and, and he just wanted to sort of provide an overview of the code that we're kind of relying on in this newest version of the text as, as um, a key piece of defining hazardous versus non-hazardous, which is uh, NFPA 1, which is the, the sort of national fire code that's been adopted by Massachusetts, and Chapter 38, which uh, is specific to um, marijuana, both cultivation and man manufacturing facilities. And as he'll explain in that chapter, uh, there are multiple types of hazardous manufacturing procedures that are regulated by that code. Um, and so the, the sort of distinction that we're proposing is any activity that is regulated by that chapter would be excluded from the limited manufacturing uh, zone. And in addition to that sort of black and white line, uh, we've got the, the descriptive text that specifically calls out certain activities that may be allowed as long as they don't have uh, hazardous inputs. And then um, uh, a, a more general definition of what's not allowed, which is the use or storage of propane, butane, ethanol, carbon dioxide uh, in the manufacturing process. So sort of trying to build multiple layers around explaining exactly what is and is not allowed. Um, and again, I, I think uh, you know, Chris can, can potentially speak to some questions about the appropriateness of that sort of line of demarcation, um, but we, we feel pretty good about it um, and you know, would say that, it, that it's more carefully defined than, than some of the other uses um, that are allowed in commercial for, for non-hazardous processes. So, so we feel pretty good about that. And then there was the question of sort of verification. And, you know, we, we uh, there was some discussion last week about the possibility of um, independent inspections to sort of verify that the kinds of processes that are allowed in a limited manufacturing facility would actually be the ones going on. Um, and we kicked that around over the last week and kept running again, up against the problem because uh, because the, the sort of ideal was let's find some kind of inspection that's already going to happen, um, and then that can be something that could be submitted to the town, to the to the uh, ZBA, to the planning board um, as that step of verification. But the issue is that there there are no regulations and inspections of processes that you're not doing, um, and so the sorts of things that we're talking about with sort of the, the ice water bath and the, the rolling of products uh, don't trigger um, any of those sorts of inspections, not even unfortunately to the point where say a health inspector would inspect a, a restaurant. So um, that, that sort of led to a dead end uh, a little bit in terms of something that's going to be happening as a routine procedure anyway. Um, so in, you know, if, if there are other, you know, suggestions that we people, people on here that can, that can talk about the, the reasonableness of those, but I uh, was just sort of looking at, in context, um, at some of the concerns. And, you know, as I understand it, the, the major concern uh, of, of the planning board, and I've heard this over the years that I've been coming to you folks, is, is enforcement of your code is sometimes uh, a challenge, let's say. Um, 
And so if the zoning has this separation between types of processes that are going on, you know, the, the board is interested in some kind of uh, assurance that, that there's a way to, to uh, keep it within the lane of limited uh, marijuana manufacturing. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that, that are sort of in the text that we have already and also within the zoning code all, uh, that, that help uh, and, and also in the, in the larger world, um, I, I listed out a little bit. Um, and so the things that I would point out are that um, our original draft of the text, which uh, I deleted it since this became sort of an open question and now it's a TBD line, um, but I had suggested uh, that in the application process, uh, that the applicant sort of be required to spell out specifically what they're going to be doing, so that that can be um, reviewed for compliance with the limited manu marijuana manufacturing. Um, and so, you know, that that's something that can that can be on records uh, that could be readily verified uh, if someone uh, is actually going to the site. Um, I would point out that actually the zoning bylaw already uh, in, in number 16 on that list of special permit criteria under the marijuana bylaw uh, reserves the right for ZBA planning board and other town officials uh, to inspect the site. Um, so there's already um, sort of uh, a, a reservation of the right to, to do that inspection. Um, and uh, in the case of an, another sort of important topic with these facilities, security, you know, security uh, is sort of in the in the early review stage is pushed off on the police department, and there's no specific requirement that the security plan uh, be inspected regularly. But the reality is that uh, the police are coming to these facilities to check in, um, to to keep contact. Uh, to understand, you know, that, that things are still being run appropriately. Um, and so, you know, one question would be, is there a prerogative of, of the fire department to uh, create a similar sort of relationship for these specific facilities? Um, there is also the opportunity uh, periodically for the host community agreement and also the special permit to be renewed. Um, those are both uh, under state law and also in the zoning that those renewals will happen uh, periodically, and so there's an opportunity to, to sort of check in and, you know, perhaps refresh that list of exactly what is going on, um, and uh, there'd be the opportunity for a site visit also, I suppose. Um, and then importantly, and this, this sort of gets to outside of the realm of zoning, is that if any of the disallowed uh, pro uh, processing procedures is to be implemented, uh, codes and laws require that those go through the local fire department, in many cases, the, the state fire marshal's office, and that there is a requirement to create a situation where there'd be notice to the town that those are being implemented. And absent that notice, uh, it's, it's violation of the law. Um, and there's building code, yeah. fire, I, I listed this off last week, building code, fire code, state fire marshal's office, Cannabis Control Commission, um, and then, you know, in, in the event of, of a more serious incident, there's there's civil and, and potential criminal liability um, if those things are, are happening. So that's sort of setting the table for the, the ultimate question of perhaps that's good enough verification. And, and board members may feel differently, um, but like I said, we did sort of try to go through that exercise um, of, of finding something that was going to be happening anyway um, and, and had difficulty because of the fact that since we're not doing things that would be regulated, um, there's there's no inspection of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so happy to pause there uh, if questions or, or discussion that, that we want to pick up from that point, um, or we do uh, have, have Chris Witherall who can speak with a little more authority and specificity than I can um, about sort of what separates these hazardous procedures versus not uh, in, in the legal regime and the code um, and engineering practice and, and sort of commissioning processes, which could be valuable. I have one indirect question, which okay. is to what extent would these, would the specific processes and the details 
of them that a given operator might implement in one of these facilities be um, treated, considered a, um, you know, like, I don't know about proprietary, but I'm searching for the word, you know, it's like basically privileged information, company confidential, something that they, that would be a, um, uh, a competitive advantage that they would want to hold closely versus disclose to a public body. Um, Cause I'm just trying to understand mm -hmm. like how much, you know, the, 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 the tension between asking for certain kinds of disclosures and inspections and, um, you know, creating other business risks to the organization. Great. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a very good question that I do not have the answer to. But between Jared and and other Chris, I suspect uh, we can give you a pretty thorough answer to that. So so what I would say is that in our application to the Triple C uh, for a product manufacturer, we have to disclose what products we intend to make, um, and so it doesn't require that we say the specific process that we use. But if we say something like we're producing live resin or you know butane hash oil, yeah. then the the process is implied that we're using that we need to operate in a classified space. If we say we're making distillate, it implies that you're using ethanol. Okay. Um, so so all of that would be prior disclosed to the state, um, and. Uh, yeah, that would be very much out in the open, the products that we were producing, and then, you know, kind of the back end of how we were producing it, broadly speaking, would, would be would be known. And is it also fair then, Jared, to say that the, the chemical or non-chemical, or the material, let's just say generically, the material inputs and outputs of your process would not be considered proprietary, you know, that would necessarily say what's going on in the in the activity of turning those inputs into the outputs. But right. If the, but if a, if a body wanted some disclosure, the support, for example, later, where I'm thinking about is to support later inspections, for example. You know, if we were to, I'm not saying we would do this, but if we were asked for details on, um, you know, not the sensitive aspects of the processes, but essentially the inputs and outputs. Um, I'm wondering if just knowing that could be sure. helpful to us. So for instance, we would be happy to disclose that we use hydrocarbon in our, you know, in our butane extraction process. Mm -hmm. um, but what specific blend of propane and butane we use, that's, you know, a level of like, yeah, this is a little bit more proprietary, but yeah, we're making, you know, we're making BHO, we're making live resin, which, okay. you know, anybody that, was familiar would know that we're using hydrocarbon. Yeah, the line of questioning is that the more we can, so it, one of our concerns might simply be a kind of due diligence concern, like what as part of uh, performing site reviews of such facilities, you know, I'm trying, I try to regularly remind myself that while you're the proponents of, of this particular um, change the zoning and we know you, know you as one operator by adding this to our bylaws, we open the door to you know other operators who may be not like you, <laughs> whatever that may mean, right? For so sure. I'm thinking along the lines of the more we're able to um, gain a certain amount of disclosure at the, at the initial site review time, then that might give the board some leverage down the road um, to know whether there have been changes and that now, you know, first by asking the question, we might be able to assess whether it really does involve hazardous materials or not based on the, the inputs and outputs being disclosed. And then secondarily, um, you know, if we were, if we did have language to allow us to do, um, you know, inspections at, at applicant um, or at you know, operator expense, then we would have something of record to compare against during a later inspection. Yeah, and I, I would defer to Chris, uh, Chris Witherell as well. Um, you know, the, the kind of the main kind of things that we're trying to push out are <laughs> ethanol, CO2, 
and you know, butane hash uh, production, right? So those are the kind of the three things. And that, to be clear, by push out, he means exclude from from this use. That, Yes. As opposed to a into the environment. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank. You. That's a good. That's a good uh, steer. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I think. Oh, go ahead, Jared. No. 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 Uh, please. Please, Chris. Yeah. So uh, I just. I'm just going to pop in and, and uh, give you guys kind of a little technical background, real quick. Uh, I'm a licensed professional engineer, mechanical. Uh, been doing this for almost nine and a half years in this particular industry across the country, started in Colorado. I'm licensed in 25 states, including Massachusetts. So we do a lot of work in Massachusetts. Uh, our focus is solvent-based extraction and refinement. And so <clears throat> when we started doing this in 2014 in Colorado, there was no code available to regulate this type of processing. And so uh, a committee was formed with NFPA, uh, and I, I was part of that. And we wrote chapter 38 in, in late 2016 and early 2017. Uh, to deal with solvent-based processing and manufacturing. Uh, so I think the distinction here really is if it's a, a solvent, then that's what you guys want to exclude. If it's something like water, that would not be considered a solvent. Uh, so that type of a process has no hazards associated with it. So it would be not regulated by Chapter 38. Um, only things like butane propane, ethanol, uh, carbon dioxide, hexane, mm -hmm. pentane, heptane, all those types of solvents are regulated by that. Those are the ones that can get you know, a little dangerous. Um, and that chapter deals with not only the equipment approval for that type of processing equipment, but it also deals with facility approval. And depending on what you're using in your process, you have a heck of a lot uh, of things that need to go into your facility in order to make it safe. Uh, like as mentioned previously, uh, classified electrical equipment, class one division one electrical zones, class one division two electrical zones, hazardous exhaust systems, uh, things like that. So, uh, you know, if if someone was to go in and, and perform an inspection on a facility that was doing any, any of these uh, processes that are regulated by chapter 38, it would be very obvious that they're doing industrial type processing in there. Um, and, I'm open to any technical questions you have. So if anyone has any, uh, please, please feel free. I'm still mulling at this point. Others? I, I don't have a technical question and it's, it's more a CCC question. It's my understanding that the CCC does not regulate um, marijuana manufacturing by degree of hazard hazardous material it's not one of the the factors that they take into account once they've approved something um and so if if someone were to move from one from non-hazardous to hazardous and it was the ccc that was doing the inspection presumably they would have to have recently read our bylaw to know that that wasn't permitted. Um, is that correct? I mean, I, I think of them as, as operating on this checklist that says, yeah. we, this, this facility complies with all local zoning. Um, so, so procedurally, what would happen is two things is they would, I think, reach out to the um, they would reach out. So this, in this case, it would be somebody in an industrial zone, for instance, that applied for a limited manufacturer and then was trying to move, trying, uh, well, no, actually that, that wouldn't make sense because the licenses. Um, so, and I, and I think it may be important to, to separate two distinct points um, because when a facility is getting set up, there is, there are, I think, two different um, on-site inspections by the CCC before they're allowed to start operating. And then my understanding is, as the operation is ongoing, the CCC has the right to pop in and inspect, um, but they are not on any particular schedule where they do uh, 
uh, necessarily do that inspection, say, you know, every, once a year or anything like that. Um, and uh, there may, and, and I also make that, I think make that distinction most significantly because um, during the initial inspection and in the initial startup phase, um, they will have a copy of the special permit as part of the application package that they're verifying against. Um, so the, the answer may, just may be different, um, uh, initial inspection versus something periodic. Okay, that was a little muddled. I thought that was a clearer point until I got in the middle of it. Yeah. Well, that, that was fine. Thank you. And yeah. I, just, I just want to throw one thing in here from an occupancy standpoint. So any of this solvent-based processing would have to take place in, a, in an F1 moderate hazard factory industrial occupancy or an H3 high hazard occupancy. Uh, so things like water um, extraction would not have to be in that type of a in industrial occupancy. So uh, if that helps. Yeah, um, I, I think the kind of the, the hurdle would occur at um, when an applicant was trying to set up their C1D1, when they were trying to set up their classified spaces, and they would need to talk to both the local authority having jurisdiction, the fire chief, as well as the state authority having jurisdiction. So recently, Massachusetts uh, regulations changed that you, it was not sufficient to just go to your local authority, you had to go to the state authority. Um, and so we, we went through that process. Um, so there would be there would be those additional checks on the fire and you know life safety side as well. So maybe I'll just voice some, maybe where we are right now, Chris and Jared is a kind of feedback phase, right? I mean, you're the proponents of this provision and we're giving you feedback on language. I think what I'm seeing on the screen is we're now having a discussion about what might be replacing the yellow highlighted material there. And it's and sort of thinking aloud here, it seems like as part of the initial site review, I could imagine a board like ours wanting to have some um, so some of that language could be about disclosing or documenting the, yeah, like I said, sort of the material inputs and outputs of the process. So sort of the shedding light on what's, you can, you can name the process, but also saying something about the material inputs and outputs. Um, I have to say without thinking more deeply and broadly about how we deal with other kinds of things like this in our community. I mean, change happens, right? We zone, we approve things, and then really all kinds of changes can happen within a building <laughs> that we may or not may or may not find out about. <laughs> and I don't know if we how often and how broadly we give ourselves the right to um, you know, initiate inspections or um, have inspections performed by contractors we select, but at cost of the um, operator, but things like that, like, I just haven't, I know we've done, we've done, there's a precedent for those kinds of things elsewhere in our zoning bylaws, but. Well, and, and as I mentioned earlier, there's under the marijuana bylaw, there's a specific, uh, uh, components uh, number 16 out of that list of 21 points, which I'll read. The marijuana establishment may be inspected and or monitored at various times during its construction and operation. The ZBA, a special permit granting authority, or the planning board pursuant to site plan review process may hire an inspector with background experience in marijuana cultivation, exterior odor control and measurement, stormwater management, or other expertise relative to marijuana establishments to provide inspection and monitoring services uh, as at the expense of the project proponents. Such required inspections may be specified in the special permit and or site plan review conditions. 
So there's already pretty strong language that you absolutely have the right to do that at a minimum. Because I haven't memorized that part of the Bible. <laughs> And I would just add that Chief Hannum has been to our site many right. times and would right. be able to clearly recognize what a C1D1 uh, looks like. Um, so if if he were to visit another site uh, and see something looking like what we have, I, I think it would I, I think he would know instantly. Um, I, I, you know, I think all of the all of the information prior to establishing something like this um you know would have to come in front of in front of the the the, the authority having ju jurisdiction the fire chief uh well before anything were set up um uh, uh unless somebody was doing it you know operating illegally uh, i mean and, and well i think that's our concern the latter that somebody's <laughs> operating illegally yeah, yeah. No, that somebody starts off doing, being very scrupulous and then decides, gee, there's more profit margin in X mm -hmm. and moves to, to a solvent-based processing. And probably in the course of that, if they're going to be violating the zoning to begin with, they may not, they're probably not being as scrupulous as they should be about the fire or electrical code either um and so we have this, you know i part of this is is so that i think it's the first question that everybody has had how do we know that it stays this way <laughs> and i suspect when this gets to town meeting that's going to be a question as well so um and and the suggestion about an annual inspection was to try to to mitigate that concern um if you'd you know this is your proposal and we will refer it to town meeting with a recommendation plus minus or neutral um and it's your proposal. It's going to be your wording. Yeah, but, I'd, I'd like to chime in there. Um, I, I think it's, as I'm listening to this, an odd situation is developing where a, a, a consultant and stepping back, a consultant for, for a, an applicant is developing bylaw language for, for the planning board on behalf of that a client of their their client, and this isn't a this isn't a, a process that is emerged out of planning needs from the Waitley Planning Board, um, but is but is more rem, it's reminiscent of the Baronis uh, Solar Field uh, Solar uh, Facility that um, we dealt with a while back, where a, a business comes in has has a has a, a proposal presented to us by a consultant. Um, to advance their business plan, but is, is not embedded in necessarily in a Waitley planning initiative. And so does that stand as independent of, of the planning board um, with, with all rights to take it to the town meeting, but not representing it as a plan, Waitley planning board initiative? Um, and the precedent that I worry about there is that with any business in, in a commercial or industrial zone or any or any so at large um, can come in with a proposal to change that bylaw based on the specific needs and proposal of the applicant. And that, that's, that's troubling to me. It's a, it's, a, it's a version of spot zoning. So it, and um, I worry about that, a setting that we would be, we would be overturning the, the Baronis solar field precedent that we set by, move, by moving forward with this proposal, because um, that's the same process they went through, and we became neutral on that, and let and they took it, did, I don't think they took it to town meeting, as a matter of fact. So I've, I've, I've got procedural concerns here, that this is 
that all the parties are getting too close when there should be more independence among the decision-making bodies. Um, I, I can appreciate that. I think what our intention of, of trying to come and uh, work with you folks is, is that you know the, the bylaw inside and out. And yes, this is, this is text that, that Jared would like to bring to town meeting, but uh, knowing that, that you know how the bylaw was put together, and the concerns of the town, I think that that the feedback and input is what we were seeking, and and perhaps uh, perhaps we've gotten to a point where we've heard what what your assessment of your own concerns are, and and that you believe those to to represent the concerns that town meeting will have, and and perhaps we we just take that and and prepare the text that that we think is. Uh, what we want to advance. I think that makes sense. I think that probably it, it would behoove us to have a public hearing so we at least can ask for public input before we make our recommendation on whether to support this or not. But I, it, I do think it should be your text. I mean, it is your text, it's mm -hmm. just not our text. And we've done our best to try and give you some feedback. I concur with Judy that uh, taking this into a public hearing is the right next step. I'm not, I, I appreciate Tom's point. I'm not sure, I have to think about it some more. Else. I'm not sure that I quite share his concerns because I do see the Baronis situation and this is materially different, but I would have to think about it more carefully before I could articulate exactly why I feel that. I do feel like as a, a the planning board can and should be responsive to um, members of our community bringing ideas and recommendations to the board. I mean, that's what Baronis did, and we took a position on that, and that's what DMCTC is doing here. I don't feel like we should only consider our own ideas originating within the board, but- We actually don't have any choice, Brand. It's required in the law that we, we review suggestions from property owners. So, so there you are, right? We, there, there is a formal process and we're, we're in the midst of it. Yeah. My, where I am with this right now, I think is, um, I suppose my feedback would be under that, in that, in place of that yellow highlighted text, some, some succinct tight language on disclosure related to the process and the material inputs might be sufficient for, for just me at this point in combination with the language that you reminded me and others of in the existing bylaw. That the, you know, when a, a, an individual comes before the ZBA or the planning board at that time during site review or evaluation of a special permit, the ZBA or the planning board may specify and require um, periodic inspections. We don't have to say here what those inspections will be, but I'm sure that without requiring as part of the application that there's the adequate disclosure of what's going on, subsequent inspections wouldn't be as um, effective. So that's my, my, my third thinking is that just clarifying that part of uh, what would be required as part of the site um, plan approval application might be enough in combination with what's already in the bylaw. Great, well, appreciate that feedback. Um, and again, and I think just to, to um, address one other point, I think that, you know, our, our response to the concern that, that this may be sidling up to, to some kind of spot zoning, 
I think as, as we'll present at the public hearing, our, our primary argument here is that, uh, that we wanna bring this manu marijuana manufacturing uh, into consistency with some of the other light industrial uses um, articulated in the code where there's a distinction between hazardous and non-hazardous. And, and we'll argue that, that in fact, this, this is making uh, making this particular land use more consistent with um, with the larger bylaw, um, if anything, and that'll be uh, obviously up up for anyone's interpretation as to whether they agree with that. Maybe I'll, at the risk of beating a dead horse, I'll make one more comment, sort of in support of what Tom said. the The issue here might be to what extent are we um, making this change in our bylaws really to almost exclusively benefit the one proponent of it? You know, that DMCTC is already in town, wants to do this in a commercial district. So, you know, we're tweaking it so that that can happen and that benefits this one organization. Or is a stronger argument, which I think is what Tom was alluding to, and where we had a problem in the Verona's case, is that um, it seemed too tightly, in that case, it seemed too tightly and narrowly focused on benefiting one, it, one entity versus the town. So if there were an argument here about how making this allowance in our zoning bylaw allows not only your hazard, non-hazardous manufacturing business to have a place in town, but potentially creates other economic development opportunities for other players elsewhere in town, that would be start to make it a more compelling case for change. And so to that point, I mean, I, I think you, you, those words were exactly right, is it creates more economic opportunity for others in town. If muffins, you know, wanted to produce muffins, uh, gummies, they would already have a commercial kitchen there in a commercially zoned area. Um, and that would be, you know, already allowable uh, in that kind mm -hmm. of an area. And, and you know, tea guys, uh, you know, same ideas if they wanted to be able to produce uh, I, I don't know, you know, offhand whether the tea guys are in a commercial uh, or or what zone they're in, but that's exactly the idea: is that not only would we make use of this, but others that were interested, uh, that already are, you know, co business owners in town that had an interest to do this, um, would be able, or or investors uh, elsewhere might be might be uh, able to do uh, to make use of this, uh, and that would lead to further investment, you know, further uh, employment. Um, you know, potential raises in in property values as a result of having more jobs here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all of the kind of the salutary effects of increased investment in the community. Okay. Um, okay. The important question: Can you have everything ready by next Wednesday, if necessary? I would say absolutely yes. So we're committing, Judy, to putting no. this on? No, but no. that's what input into the decision. OK. <laughs> All right. If I had said no, then it's a moot point. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But we don't know for sure that that's when the, the, no, the town meeting is going to get. We know where to find them. <laughs> All right. Usually right here. <laughs> <laughs> So, Jared, I've got a question for you. Um, if we get some more grow facilities in town, would you assume that they're going to be able to make more profit with a finished product than to sell and that other people would want to do this as well? Yeah, I mean, so the zoning for grow facilities, which actually would be allowed in commercial if they were indoor. I guess I just had outdoor in, in my mind because that's where that's mostly what we have in town here. Um, to the extent that we have grow facilities in town that are in commercial areas, yes. Um, and in fact, that would be a major 
a major benefit to them uh, and may even help them survive um, you know the current the current environment of price compression um, is that you know outdoor grows solo cultivation is is very very difficult to survive on its own right now and aside from DMC I believe I, I believe the other operators in town are all um, solo cultivators. Um, so to the extent that in the future, there are uh, people that are putting up cultivation operations in the commercial zone, uh, this would be a major, major, major boon to them. A and, and that's not us. I mean, we, we are not doing that. Yeah, but as and as an observer of Jared's business, as soon as it became apparent that there was a route to add manufacturing near Seven River Road, which turned into the Three River Road project, he jumped at it um, because of the um, the the opportunity to have that that synergy between field to final product. Yeah. Yeah. One final question. Uh, Basically, what you're going to be doing in your manufacturing is similar to what a home grower would be doing uh, to get enhanced products. Exactly. Uh, I mean, so I think water hash is, you know, that's something I think many, many people enjoy doing uh, that grow their own. Um, you know, that's freezing, flash freezing the product and then agitating it in a basically in a garbage barrel filled with my, you know, ice cubes and micron bags to separate the, the trichomes out and to make a even more refined product. It, it, it's exactly that, or, or to make, you know, butter and, and edibles. It, it's exactly that, uh, Don, that's exactly right, is, uh, you know, the average home grower is not setting up a butane, uh, a butane lab. And if they are, you know, they're doing it at considerable risk to themselves. They ought not to do that. Right. Um, but you know, making making cookies and and gummies is certainly a you know certainly a thing that people do, uh, and, and you know bubble hash as well. So so exactly right. That's exactly what we're talking about. Anything else? Chris, hey, can you um, unshare? Do we um, sorry, what want to make a that? motion to oh unshare hearing on this? What was the question, Don? Um our, I guess our next step would be to uh, have a public hearing on this and um, maybe that we could have a motion to do that at this point? I'm happy to make that motion. Are we, I thought we were, I sort of inferred from what Judy was suggesting that we're tonight trying to figure out all the things that we're gonna to try to get done for annual meeting and then sort of make a motion all at once. Well, it's, they, they would like some closure on this. So Sure. Well, then I'm happy to move that we, um, schedule a public hearing um, on this topic as soon as practicable, which well, could be April 19th. A second that. Well, what was the date, please? So I said as soon as practicable. We don't know the date yet, Mary. We were... Oh, well, I, I missed a piece of it, but I thought it was a date. So what was the motion? <laughs> We um, we schedule a public hearing on this proposed bylaw revision. Okay. I think we'll set up, uh, set back the uh, the date of that public hearing until we see find out some other information. Okay. So, any other discussion on the motion? Okay, um, call roll, Don, yes. Brent? Yes. Chris? I'm sorry, uh, Tom? <laughs> yes. Sarah? Yes. And Judy? Yes. Motion passes.
You guys are just going to try to put me on the board whether I like it or not. <laughs> no, no, Chris is a member of the board. N nicely done, Chris. <laughs> we do need, we could use an engineer. Then you'd have to recuse yourself from everything you talk about. <laughs> right. Yeah. Jared won't let you live in Waitley as a result. Probably not. <laughs> Great. So, uh, and for, for our part, we'll get right on deciding what we're going to propose as final text and get it to you prior to April 5th. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on and go to uh, changes to the uh, zoning map to review problems with it. Well, I don't know who's leading that. We got, a, I forwarded a flurry of emails from Ryan, and then it seemed like he also sent other emails to everybody on the board. So, Don, you've been working most closely with Ryan. Where do, where do matters stand in your view? Well, um, the only question he had for me was where did the um, aquifer overlay zone, uh, zones come from? He doesn't have anything. Um, showing where um, zone three came from. And I added that to the map back in 19, or 2013. And for the, I looked through um, all of my information and I don't have any metadata as to where that uh, shape file came from. And um, Tom, you originally worked on those zones. Uh, well, I've been pulling my, my brain to, uh try and remember whether it was the, um, so it was a combination between UMass Geology Department and, and um, Mass DEP. But I, I don't, I just honestly don't remember. The but bylaw the, says that they're based on a Mass D. Don't. I'm sorry, Tom. Was it bylaw says they're based on Bylaw says they're based on a mass DEP study right. and outline. And presumably then, and it, they were enacted. It's hard to tell from the bylaw, but it looks like the, the one for the water district was enacted before the one for the, for the I'm, I'm sorry, for the water department was enacted before the, the um, district. But the district one was added to the map in 2007. I know that. But who did the, the actual cartography? I don't know. Tom, you don't, doing have, you don't have an original map? Say it, Tom. Do, you have an, do you have an original? You don't have an original map um, that, that went to town meeting? for the passage and, uh, and discussion of the aquifer projection zone? I don't, can't find anything in my files and I put everything in, in one folder. God. But we no longer have the Waitley Water District. So if one of those was specifically for the Water District and it kind of looks like it because it's, it's got the, uh, the foothills um, which is where water would be entering into that, into that zone. Maybe I can talk to uh, Nicholas Jones and he may have a memory of that. Well, Nicholas did confirm that the, the, that the water district has the two, has a zone two and a zone three. And one of the issues for us tonight is whether we take those off or not. Um, but that original map has got to live somewhere because we, we use well, it. Must, there must be a copy in town offices. Well, I remember working with some engineer that, that Nicholas put me in touch with as to um, how that water would percolate down through the, through the, um, the geology of the that area because it's all fractured stone all the way from the water divide the divide for that area between uh, Conway and, and Waitley and um, 
all of all of the uh, fractures are dipping towards um, where the water wells were. So I don't know. I'll I'll get in touch with Nicholas and see if he has any memory of it though. Let me just share. I, this was sent around to everybody, but this is what um, towards the later later part of the afternoon today, Ryan from FERCOG sent around as a, a current draft map showing basically all the, all five zones where AR2 is not, basically anything that's not color coded. One of the things he did ask about was this tiny little parcel can I zoom this in? Uh, up by town offices on uh, Long Plain. Let me see if I can do I'll do this. So here's town. If people can see my mouse, this is where town offices is in this little purple area, and then the red areas to the immediately to the north and to the northwest are. Um, commercial and commercial industrial. And then there's just to the south of town offices, there's this small squarish parcel that was showing up on the previous map as also in the commercial industrial district, but it seems to be just an area of farm field. And Ryan was asking, is this, is it really in the commercial industrial? It just didn't seem logical. And so one question is, is what does anyone know about that? Uh, I can remember, I'm sorry. That, that definitely has been on, on the, the map for quite a while. So. If you look uh, at the, if you look at the assessor's map, all the rest of, all, all the area around that is an APR and that's not. And I remember when we did the, I believe that that should be there. Um, I can't remember the reason, but I remember we talked about it. Okay. Well, it is, a, it is a separate property from the rest of that big uh, field. Yeah, it's owned by nurse. So we don't, we don't exactly know the history of it, but we believe it's, appropriately zoned commercial industrial for whatever reason it should be left as is. Yeah, I'll check with, uh, with, with Lynn and see if she remembers anything about that. Okay. Yeah, I'm quite, I do remember we talked about it. We decided that it was to be left, but I, I'm not remembering the logic. Sarah, do you remember? No, because that was before anybody here was on the board, except you, maybe, Judy. Shoot. You're um, the senior oldest member, member. That's true. Senior, anyway. You are probably both, actually. Um, we go back to the, whether the, the zone two and three should for the zoning for the district should come off or not. Um, when we talked about it last at last week, I think there was a general sense that gee, it would be nice to leave those those two on as long as in just in case the wells the district wells could be used as backup in an emergency. And Tom talked to Nicholas, who said, no, it wasn't going to work. And I talked to Wayne, and he said that wasn't going to work. And then we got an email or contacted FERCOG, and they, they sent the DEP. There was an issue about whether the regulations required it to come off or required those zones to come off. The zone has been formally, the well has been formally abandoned. 
and DEP therefore no longer considers those areas protected. And the advice we got from FERCOG was that if anybody then contested their presence, we would have no defense. And so I concluded from that that it, it made no sense to keep them as much as I hate to take protections off the map. Well, my, my feeling on that is that we should keep them because there's no way that anybody in that area um, is going to be able to get town water. And so people that buy on the um, west side, uh, or the, sorry, the south side of Hayden um, Mill Road are going to have to put in wells. Mm -hmm. and that's that zone is going to protect that water uh, mm -hmm. that sub subterranean water mm -hmm. my understanding was once they're decommissioned though you can't use them and uh, Wayne, both Wayne and Nicholas said that um, they, they didn't they wouldn't have the capacity step in in an emergency to meet the uh, needs. He's saying, he's saying private well owner, private. I Future think. owners. Right. Need to put in wells there. And so it'd be good if that land was still protected. Mm -hmm. He's not talking about the, the district yeah. wells being reused. People like us who don't, who can't connect to a town water main. Right. So is that a strong enough argument to leave those um, aquifer protection districts in place? It seems like, so. yeah. We could redefine that, that area rather than being for the uh, Whitney Water District for future yeah. landowners. I think it's worth exploring at any rate. Yeah. So, so leave it as leave it as it is for now. Yeah. This yeah, this starts to me to sound like something a little too involved to be able to get done for this annual town meeting. And am I also right in hearing yeah, that we, could. we may not be able to give Ryan the data he needs to properly draw the aquifer protection districts on the new map? No, he can remove that at, at any time. That's really easy to uh, modify, to take those off. And uh, it, it's a really easy no, he's, project to do. Uh, just the opposite. Can I understand put, it's easy to remove, but does, he, does Ryan have the data on the contours of the existing as defined aquifer protection zones so that, because what we do ideally want to do at this town meeting is get a new zoning map voted on, right? And I think to do that, we want the it to be as complete as possible and display the aquifer protection zones. So does Ryan have that data or not? That's the part I'm missing from the conversation. Well, if we at some point decide to take out zone two, um, that's easy to do. But if we decide to leave zone three in, yeah, everything every, he has everything he to, to show the whole protection district. All okay, three. he does, yes, because he asked where we got the zone three data layer. So, so just to show you the email, just so we're all on the same page, and I'm sorry if I'm again bothering people over things they don't want to be bothered about. But so this is an email from Ryan earlier today. So I saw this question. Can you tell me where you got the zone three data layer? I've never heard of that. Now, my reading of that question is that he doesn't have the data for the zone three data layer. He does have it. He didn't, doesn't have the metadata for it. Okay. And he doesn't need the metadata. Well, 
it can go up there without the metadata, but it would be good to know where it came from. Okay. And so well, well, maybe there's another question. Who's willing to put it up there without the metadata? You got a little garbled, Judy. Could you repeat yourself, please? I'm Zoom. sorry. He can put it up without the metadata, but is he willing to? Does does do his standards require him to have the metadata? Um, and I don't think any but any of us can answer that. Yeah. So it, it would I would prefer not to have to be trying to take notes on this. Like Don, you have this email. Could you work with Ryan on these questions? Yeah. Um so we think he's got uh, he, so let's see where I where I think we are. That Ryan has all the aquifer protection zone data. He asked about the that weird little parcel that we talked about, but we've agreed that it's legitimate. So I can at least easily respond to this email and say, don't delete that that little uh, CI district south of the, the town offices. Um, he wrote another email. Oh, I just met with Kimberly. Who's Kimberly? Uh, and she figured out that she and I created the zone three about 16 years ago. So, so now this is interesting. So she said, he says, I have to do some digging and find that data layer, which again makes me think that he doesn't have the zone three data layer more than just he's got the zone three shape, but not the metadata. But I'm not sure about that. Um, and now he sent that at 12.09. So go ahead, Judy. Kimberly, is that for Cub? She's the one who sent the DEP. Okay. She, she shepherded it all. Helped us shepherd the whole aquifer protection process from from beginning to end. Ah. And so I'm not surprised that, that she that they created that zone three. Okay. All right. So then this was the last email that Ryan sent at about three this afternoon. I have most of the edits. Um, uh, very quickly, is he looking for zone two metadata? He says zone three. And I also have to find that zone three layer I mysteriously lost. Okay, well, zone three and zone two. Hold on here. Uh, and Judy, I assume that we're under the same so deadline, right? We need to have a, a map by April 5th. <laughs> yeah, and I, well, I should say, Brian was quite nice on his email. He said that he felt that, that um, he, he didn't, he, he anticipated that there would be pushback from the board if, if um, possible pushback and, but he really wanted the board to feel that they didn't have to be rushed and that uh, doing it right was better than being rushed. Mm -hmm. But he wanted us all to discuss it and make sure we were comfortable and, and come to an opinion on our own. Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. He's he's not he's not pressing us to have this uh, this public hearing on the nineteenth, um, but he wants us to to discuss it and make sure that if we do, we're going to do it right, because mm -hmm. then he needs the material. He has to have the material by the 
the 26th at the absolute latest. Mm -hmm. So if there are any changes that come out of the town meeting, uh, out of the public hearing, um, we would have to write the report on our recommendation to on the DMCTC thing after the public hearing. Right. Um, however we rule on it, it's, it's the report has to be written and we'd have to approve it all. So, so it just seems to me that if we're, you know, personally trying to get this all done first by the fifth and then, and then between the 19th and the 26th just sounds fraught with peril. <laughs> but I agree. And on a related theme, I was pondering, and so maybe again, I'll ask this question. So we often, maybe I don't know if it's a regular occurrence in Waitley, but we often do these special town meetings. Um, and while it seems to me I wouldn't try to do the DMCTC revision as a special town meeting, certain kinds of housekeeping things like fixing the garbled language in the solar bylaw. I, I'm a little unclear, like what's the, it seems, I, I know we've done some zoning related things at special town meetings. So there's clearly some threshold where we say, you know, it's okay to take that to a special town meeting, but, and certain things are like, no, they're too, they really require pre presentation at, a, at an annual town meeting. So I'm kind of raising this to see where are these issues on that threat, on that spectrum, like is, voting the approved, the revised zoning map, something that really should be at an annual town meeting versus a special town meeting? I think, well, in that case, it depends whether it's housekeeping or not. If it's just fixing corrections, it can probably be a special town meeting. You know, if, if you're talking about the, the garbled language and the solar bylaw, things, the things that are easy, the housekeeping things, like taking the water district wording out of the aquifer protection district, those aren't going to be hard to do. Right. And they, they, you know, they're not very technical and I don't think there'll be any problem at town meeting. Um, the report and the wording for DMCTC um, and making sure that the zoning bylaw is what we want it to be. I, I think those are more problematic. Yeah, yeah, I would. So that seems like an argument for at least seeing, you know, seeing if we can get the DMCTC bylaw adjudicated whether that goes to town meeting or not. We, that seems to have to meet a near term deadline. It seems like trying to get the zoning map revised. I don't think we can, we, well, I'm sorry, did I, you, see, you I think, said you yeah, thought that? I think we are going in the same direction. Go ahead, Judy. I'm, I'm not quite sure what you said. You thought that could be done on an expedited basis, DFCTC? Well, I, I guess I thought that we, well, let's just say I'm not wild about having to move, move our process up to meet an early annual town meeting full stop. I was more comfortable with the original date for the annual town meeting. I did feel like um, we should aim to come to some decision about the, we should, allow ourselves enough time and process to be able to possibly get the DMCTC revision on the annual town meeting warrant. Now, I wouldn't commit today to just postponing it for a year or something like that, but it seemed to me that I wouldn't necessarily rush on the zoning map or even the, the housekeeping change to the solar bylaw. Um, for this annual town meeting, because this now we're starting to get to. Oh wait a minute! But you to seem do. to be going. You seem to be going from moving 
town meeting, <coughs> excuse me, to the to May 9th to deferring everything. He's giving us a choice of the, the fallback is that they postpone town meeting to June. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I was only hearing that it, they wanted to move it to May 9th. Maybe, then, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear, but no, the fallback is that they would do it in June. Ah. And I don't think Brian seems any problem with that. Oh, well, that changes a lot for me. Yeah, I read May 9th. Well, that's what the select board wants to do. Oh. Well, on, on and point, it's up to us yeah. to say whether we can comply with that or not. And if we can't, then it will get pushed back to June. And I don't think Brian don't sees any it, problem with that. I don't know if it matters, but I'll be out of town from the, the uh, 6th to the 13th of May. I don't think it matters. Yeah, I don't right. think that matters. Well. But we're jealous. Um, yeah, okay. So based on that, I, I don't think there's any problem moving it back to June. Yeah, I would I would vote for saying we can't do the things that we need to do on a with proper, you know, due diligence to meet a May 9th annual meeting. And we have business that we are pursuing that we feel um, needs to get in front of, needs to reach town meeting this year and cannot be deferred a year and should not be postponed to a low attendance special town meeting. Yeah. I know that said, I don't that said, that I do need think, to add flat. I'll just say that that said, I do think that if there is an option of a special town meeting this year, then there are absolutely things that we've been working on that I might not ain't necessarily press to get on this, this next annual town meeting that I'd be happy to put on a longer timetable to get done at a special town meeting. Yep. Okay, so so we will tell them we we don't want we can't make May 9th. So I didn't see an email from Brian. Let me stop. He sent it to me. Screen. Okay. All right. Well, that's why. So you are going to respond on behalf of the planning board. Yep. Okay. He sent it to me because he I could answer for both the CBC and the planning board. Okay. Yeah, is that, there's too is much it, of a crunch to get all this in correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that that then gives us if 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 coming out of the public hearing there are changes, gives us time to do something about them too. Okay, so where where does this leave us? So where does this leave us with respect to DMCTC? and scheduling a public hearing. Right now, they've they've left the meeting tonight. They think they're gonna try okay. to get stuff to us for April 5th, which would allow us to do a public hearing on that on April 19th. And is that still what we I would think, like to do? No, I think we, I thought we were continue, I thought we continue our regular schedule and plan on the public hearing on the 26th. Okay. I think we owe it to them to get this done. Okay. So we should get them some adjusted deadlines with the plan with the idea that we're going to schedule a public hearing on their bylaw revision on August so, uh, on April 26th. So both Bob O'Bear and so then the then the material has to be in place by the 12th. Okay. Judy seems to be cutting in and out and freezing a bit. 
think I heard you say, Judy, the material needs to be there by April 12th. Is my battery going? No. I'm not talking loud enough, obviously. Well, no, it's your, it, your video is freezing too. There may be an, okay. Oh, I know what the problem is. Well, I got exiled to the kitchen and further away from the router. Okay. okay. Um, so the zoning map is not necessarily, so the, the, the next public hearing in April will be on the Waitley School and on the DMCTC zoning change. Um, and, and, and all the zoning changes we want. And what are those, right? Like what, are we gonna try to do the solar, the garbled solar bylaw language? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'd like, to, I don't see any reason not to do the aquifer overlay district wording changes. Okay. Do we need, we didn't really, and I'm unfortunately gonna to have to drop off this call in a few minutes early, I apologize. We didn't really, you sent new, a new version of the aquifer, um, the changes to the aquifer language. Do, does the board need to have a conversation about that before scheduling a public hearing on it? Yeah, I think so. I think we need to figure out what we need to do with it. And uh, if we're going to try to keep zone two or three, whichever one. Yeah. Well, the wording doesn't necessarily. The, the only place where that shows up in the wording is there's a paragraph on the map. Right. Okay, Judy's frozen again. And I guess there's also a paragraph in the beginning of the district. But if we're... Judy, you may want to shut off your video, maybe that to, will help. Maybe I'll, I'll just move in the gun. I am, I, I'm going to apologize while Judy's in motion. I'm going to have to leave the meeting tonight. I think, um, I think I'll, I'll be, uh, I, I know you're going to have to maybe schedule another, maybe another ad hoc board meeting before an, a public hearing about including the, 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 so the aquifer revision. And I, I want to make sure, I'm not sure we, quite captured, as I was re reading Mary's minutes about the discussion of the garbled language in the solar bylaw, I know we had a discussion, I know we made some proposed changes to that, but I, I was a little in a bit of a rush earlier today, so I don't know if I, we've properly captured those changes. So before I drop off, I'll just sort of say, making sure that we have the right language. We were not gonna simply restore the original language that got garbled. There was a discussion about clarifying, uh, fixing it to, to make it a little um, less easy for um, utilities to tell us they couldn't put things underground. And I'm not sure I re remember what that language was. Okay. There's a sentence in the paragraph about it. We need to discuss it. Yeah, yeah. So that would have to be figured out before a public public hearing. So, but I have I a fairly flexible schedule, so I can make any meetings, you know, over the course of April. Judy. Well, we would have to we would have to have it specified so that by the twelfth it would be finalized. And I think we do want to get that fixed by this town meeting. And I don't, I guess my question to the, can you hear me now? Is it better? Yep. 
sorry about that. Um, I guess my question to the board is whether the refinements are that important. I mean, I know we talked about it, but it would be so much easier to pass it at town meeting if we just said, gee, this section got dropped out and we're just restoring it. And also we could do it in time. Yeah. But if, if people felt that it really should be improved, then we could improve it. We could, we could, we could, what we can do is post it the way it was and then refine it at the public hearing. I'd be good with that. Okay, why don't we, a couple of us, get together and talk about that later. Okay. All right. Um, we've got minutes, and uh, also before we do the minutes, I went ahead and picked up the mail, and there were three letters, and they were all stuff that has already been passed. So, um, and none of it really concerns us. So that's what they are. I'm conscious. So, uh, meeting are uh, the uh, approval of minutes. Well, I made comments and Brant made comments. Did anybody else have any? There, uh, one you had uh, Megan Litwin listed as a participant. Yeah, I I saw that. that, that that's listed. because I I was in New York at my daughter at my daughter's house okay. when I attended that, that meeting. So I was on her com her computer. But she didn't attend. Okay. Did she Bernie Swarovski attend? She sent her regrets. I saw Bernie's <laughs> name there. That's all I can say. I. <laughs> that's all I ever see. Yeah. People he come. Didn't say anything, and he dropped off early, I believe. Okay, but he was there. I don't think Fred Barron was there. No, I don't either. I. I. No, he wasn't. I had him stuck in there, and I said, "Well, I'll see as I go through my notes." You know, was was there anything said? And it was it was, it was obvious that he wasn't there. That Brandt was going to take a message from the board to Fred. Yeah. About our deliberation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm confused where we left the the zoning wording on the aquifer overlay. Shall I just? I mean, I've I've taken out I've taken out all the references to the district. I can fix it so I leave the references that that um, I can put back the references to the map so that the 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 zoning two and three stay on the map and leave the study that references those in but then take out the rest of the wording. Or should we just, I, I, and I think it makes sense to do that. I think you're right. Was that, that probably wasn't very clear. There are like two references that would have to be changed. The Leave the map description the way it is pretty much except for the, uh, wellhead area, wellhead protection area, which never was on the map. And then um, include the, the study for the district, which defined those zone two and three. So the, those are very easily made on that draft I sent. And the rest of it is just straightforward taking out district references. Could we approve that and then? Yes. If anybody has a problem with it, we can uh, amend that at the public hearing. Okay. So I'm, I will move that we accept the minutes as corrected. Second. Any more discussion? Don, yes. Sarah? Yes. Judy? Yes. Tom? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Can we have a vote on accepting the aquifer wording? Um, 
I think we should put that off until next month. We Unless we have to. That means it won't go to town meeting. Okay. Uh, let's accept the wording on the aqua protection. Second. You can you can revise it at the public hearing if you don't right. like it, but I think it's I think it's very straightforward. And I will leave the references. I won't will be written so that it looks so there's no change to the zoning map for zone two and zone three. Okay. Is there, Judy, is there a date that that goes with what, I know you just made a couple of corrections. I couldn't get all that down, but just for referring to it in the minutes, is there something uh, I can say about exactly which we're referring, we're accepting? I will, I'll send you the name of the, it's the one I emailed yesterday. Um, From yesterday. It's Aquifer okay. Zoning District, Aquifer Protection District. Okay. Amendments so, revised or something like that. If, if you only sent one yesterday with language that, in it, I'll look for that. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nobody has anything else? This meeting is adjourned.